Films. This is a Burrows and Badgers bat rep. Yes, it is. So this is the third battle in a series of battle reports we're making for Burrows and Badgers, a campaign that we are making up. Well, mostly as we go along, we plotted out some of it. It's a narrative campaign. There are different war bands, but there's really only two of us playing. Um, the first battle report was done probably about six months ago. Uh, go check it out in the playlist. Uh, it was fought over the Red Wall Abbey model that I made for Black Dragon Miniatures in Hinkley in Leicestershire. And then the second battle report was still a couple of months ago uh, fought in Benfliot, my marsh village, village on the marsh on the banks of the River Tamesis. Uh, those two battle reports have been really well received and we wanted to carry on making more bat reps. Uh, it, it's difficult to fit bat reps in with everything else we're doing, and especially now at the moment because uh, myself and Ted, who plays these games uh, with me in these bat reports, are now both involved in an eight-player Burrows and Badgers campaign, which is going really nicely as well, called War Bands of London. There's a Facebook page for that. Uh, go check it out. Link here. Yeah, cool. Um, so we're having a lot of fun playing B&B &B at the moment and we're trying to kind of like squeeze in all the other kind of things. So this is, like I said, the third battle report. And as promised uh, some time ago, it's a, a battle report of a game set in the in a burrow. Uh, like the, the name kind of like gives it away, really. This is Burrows and Badgers uh, by Michael Lovejoy of Oathsworn Miniatures. Uh, yeah, anybody who's watched me knows this is by far my favourite game. Has been for several years now. Um, do check it out. Brilliant game. All of that. Watch all the other videos that'll tell you all about it. Watch this video and enjoy it and you'll get an idea of why I like the game so much. Um, but this battle is fought in a burrow. Or more to the point uh, in the sewers and tunnels and cellars under the great southern city of Lunden. Um, you might have watched the two uh, programs videos that I've made about making uh, underground tiles and this game is going to be the first one I've actually played on them which is great fun. Took a bit of fiddling to get the table out the way I like it uh, and in a moment or two we'll have a quick tour of the battlefield that we're playing on uh, before we get underway. It's worth noting that um, not only do we use the uh, core rules for B and B in this game, quite extensively, because there's only really one set of rules. Um, we do use um, uh, a few bits from this supplement called the Warren Percy Affair to excuse the rather uh, dog-eared look of this book. That is because it has been got by one of the dogs. One of the puppies had this. I might have to get myself another copy. Furry little feckers. Uh, and um, also, the rules for playing underground are to be found in Oathsworn Journal number one. Um, we've used the Michael's uh, underground rules and we've added a few bits of ourselves to uh, come up with stuff for the sewers and various other bits and pieces that aren't in here. House ruling is always really difficult, though, I find, though, especially when we sat down to kind of play this game, because what you always end up doing, actually, is just adding layer upon layer upon layer of complication. And um, I, I'm pretty pleased with how this all turned out. Uh, we didn't have to do that too much. What is in here works really pretty well, actually. Um, if you are a B&B &B player, but you're not aware of the Oathsworn journals, um, because they are uh, things that get talked about on the B&B &B Facebook group, that kind of thing. Uh, do check them out. They are free PDF downloads. Um, there are links to several of them on the Facebook page, but they are all to be found. There are four editions so far. Uh, they are all to be found at uh, burrowsandbadgers.com. So check that out as well. Right then, so just for people who have not seen the other two bat reps, like I said earlier, why you're still here, go and watch them. But if you want to crack on with this one, it's worth pointing out before we start that this is not a battle report where you are going to see every single dice roll. That is not my style. I'm not interested in just sitting a camera rolling and playing the way through the whole game where you just watch dice roll and 
two blokes moving models around. Um, neither is this a rules tutorial. I'm not going to explain to you how to play the game B&B. &B. If you want to learn how to play the game B&B, &B, there are loads of videos out there to tell you that. Uh, Michael Lovejoy's own series of videos are exceptionally good. And Gary at Black uh, Dragon did some great, a couple of intro videos as well. So I'm not doing that. There might be the odd explanation of the odd rule as we go. I might put the odd kind of graphic in to show off how some of the dice rolls panned out. But don't watch this video if that's what you're after. No, bollocks. Do watch this video because this is much better than those kind of videos. This is an attempt again at trying to capture the narrative. The what happened in the battle. Because that's what for me is the exciting part of Burrows and Badgers. It's the cool stories that we create um, and uh, the narrative that we build. So this, like I said, is an attempt to capture the narrative. Um, and what we need now is a bit of a catch up on what's happened so far. Previously in the Bird in the Hand, Burrows and Badgers campaign. Right, in the first game, uh, which is actually the second game that we played, but the first game that we videoed, Sir Hartley Longshanks and his retinue from the Order of the Crown, uh, a martial order of uh, warriors, uh, holy order and the like, have been sent from North Imbra to gather information and collect a package. The package turns out to be this little fella. Joe Stalin. A street rat, rat well, street bird actually. Um, street ruffian who happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and a witnessed a meeting between several nefarious characters. And it turns out that they appear to have crucial information as to the actual whereabouts and the true identity of the missing king of North Imbra. <sighs> then all this magical stuff happened. And a bit like Princess Leia, a, a, in putting the information into R2-D2 in the proper Star Wars film, somehow Joe Stalin had this information embedded into his memory. He does not know how to retrieve it. Somebody else higher up in the order, however, does. And so Hartley needs to take Joe Stalin out of the great city of London. In the first episode, Joe Stalin was taken to Redwall Abbey. The retinue fought their way into the abbey, fought off a whole war band of rats that had been sent by a mysterious toady kind of character. It went very well for the retinue. They beat off the rats and made their way down into the crypt underneath Redwall. Meanwhile, in episode two, out down on the river Timesis, right down towards the Great Sea, in the small riverside village of Benfliot, a desperate crew of pirates had to fight their way through the local militia to steal a ship to sail it up the Timesis. To what end? We're not quite sure yet. In this scenario, Sir Hartley has to get young Joe Stalin out down to the docks, out from underneath Redwall. The war bands start in the back end of the crypt in the middle of London, and they're going to have to make their way through the tunnels and sewers and cellars underneath the great city. So Hartley sends half of his war band, part of his war band, back to the chapter house to take information back there to say that they're on their way and then with the remaining members of his retinue they try to find their way out of the crypt and through the sewers. Our mysterious underworld kingpin has paid for a group of sewer jacks to enter different beast hole covers in the streets, get down into the sewers to find Sir Hartley and prevent his escape. This is what happened. Let's take a quick look at the table then. I'm really pleased with how the tiles all work out, the overall look. The board is pretty cool. You 
at the crypt and hidden behind one tomb here is the secret exit into the cellar of some shop or another and hidden behind this tomb is another secret exit that leads into the cellar of some kind of general store out through there there's also a proper exit from the crypt which leads into the tunnels under the city we have this long run of sewer that is leading out to the river Tamesis from the shop with a hidden doorway we go out into the sewer itself there's an outfall pipe there with a secret door and tunnel that leads away and you can see debris that's clogging up some of the sewer we go along this main this main run of sewer here then we get a bridge that takes us over the sewer to the doorway into the cellar of a pub which has a staircase that leads up out onto the street there's also a secret passage from the sewer over here into that same cellar so the mission is for the retinue to start here in the crypt and to make their way out of one of three possible exits over here up the stairs or out through the tunnel okay so it's worth noting we've added some additional rules to this game to make it play uh, we have used the rules as i said from the uh, journal issue number one uh, written by michael lovejoy to cover playing in the dark those rules mostly cover uh, being able to see in the dark um, and uh, the rules for torches and lanterns that kind of thing uh, it also includes the ability to break down doors along with smashing down doors we have also allowed joe starlin here uh, a set of lock picks and given him the opportunity to pick the lock of a door um, using his fortitude skill um, with a target of seven just the same as uh, smashing down the door but the difference being that when you smash if you pick the lock of a door uh, on the hole it will open silently enabling you to sneak through it uh, which has worked quite well uh, we've also added rules about um, what happens if you fall in the sewer water because it's kind of green and manky you're miserable and horrible um, and we assume that you take a wound just like you do from the uh, spell creeping things which also means that if your character stays in the water um, then they'll continue to take wounds the rules for falling in are pretty simple because there there are rules for falling in the main rule book and we've just used those so although you're not falling from height if you are within an inch of an edge uh, when you take wounds then you have to make a nibbleness test uh, and uh, if you fail you fall in the water uh, which seems to kind of work all right we were going to add rules about what way the water is flowing and you'd have to if you fell in the water you'd move with the water but that just seemed to add a whole new layer of complexity that we didn't use and didn't need so we've chosen not to do that one so we have picking locks we have uh, falling in uh, we have what happens when you get into the water we also decided that climbing out of the sewer um, was going to be a, a regular move. We were going to make it a yet another nimbleness test, um, which could possibly work. But we decided for the sake of gameplay for tonight, we decided not to do that. And you could just clamber back out of the sewer if you weren't blocked. Although we did say that falling into the water meant that you didn't count as being in base to base. So you could move more than two inches away without getting hit. Here is the retinue of Sir Hartley Longshanks, veteran knight of the Order of the Crown. Some of his retinue have been sent back to the chapter house. He's only left with a handful. On the left we have Gung Ho, an enthusiastic rabbit warrior armed with a double-handed hammer. Next we have Joe Starlin himself, the street urchin 
who overheard things he shouldn't have and now has deeply placed within him a memory of where the King of North Inver is. So Hartley stands at the back, resolute and proud, ready to fight all. Then we have Raxo, a mouse at arms, armed with his crossbow, an excellent shot. Nicodemus, a mage, and on the right hand side, Frisby, the squire of Sir Hartley. Stout, loyal, armed with a crossbow as well as his sword and buckler. And these are the Toshers, a type of watch. Sewer jacks who are employed to patrol the underbelly of the city of London. An unpleasant and dangerous job in an unpleasant and dangerous environment. Led by a fox named Gorman, assisted by a toad mage, Apone. Then we have a mouse warrior named Hicks, a hedgehog with a large hammer named Frost. Two crossbow armed warriors, a rat, Drake, and a frog, Vaz, and then a newt. Called Ripley. Right. All you gotta do is get down in the sewers and do your job. And if you just so happen to see a bunch of hoity toity looking warriors dragging a young starling screaming and kicking, then you need to secure that starling for me. Why? What's so important about a starling? Well, that. I'm afraid it's needed to know information and uh, you don't need to know. Just get down in them tunnels and find that feathery fella. Oh, and if those hoity-toity nightly types don't make it back above ground, then that's fine by me. Right, so that's settled then. I will take Waxo and Frisbee. And we will go down this tunnel to the left, try and make as much noise as we can and draw away any sewer jacks or anybody else to us. Nicodemus, you take young Joe here, go with gung-ho and go through this passage to the right. And we'll see if we can meet up outside above ground. You fellows, make sure you do a lot of sneaking around. Try not to get spotted. And we will make any potential enemy come to us. Got it? Good. Jolly good luck. See you in the daylight. So Hartley's plan is simple. Split his retinue into two groups. He and two retainers will make their way through the tunnels, making some noise and trying to draw the attention of the sewer jacks one way, allowing Nicodemus and Gung Ho to take young Joe Stalin out another way. Who knows, it might even work. Ripley patrols the sewer tunnel that leads out towards the Keys. Drake the Rat sets himself up on a bridge over the other sewer. Frost makes his way through the dark tunnels with only the guttering light of his torch to light where he goes. So Hartley, his squire and his mouse at arms find themselves in a small cellar with a doorway that must lead out onto the sewer itself. On the other side of the crypt, Joe Starling uses his roguish skills and produces a set of lock picks from a pouch picks the rusty old lock, opens the doorway into what is clearly the cellar of some kind of general store. The cellar is well lit. The Order of the Crown members can clearly see all the way through to the other side. Cautiously, they enter the cellar. It's cold and miserable patrolling in the sewers. Ripley walks up and down, not really knowing what to look for. 
or what to expect. Lit up by the light of a lantern that hung on the corner by her own torch. Continues his patrol, staying close to the bridge and making sure he close checks nearby locked doors into other cellars. So Hartley and Raxo work on the door from the cellar out into the sewer, which gives easily, it must be rotten, and the hinges crumble, the door falls in. So Hartley dives for cover and hides. Hicks, another sewer jack, arrives in the tunnels and immediately makes his way towards the sound of the falling door. Ripley also proceeds towards the sound of the fallen door. She heads up the sewer. Oh great, he's coming in. Gorman, leader of the Toshers, arrives and makes his way into the sewer to catch up Frost. Hey Frost, seen anything? No, nothing. Check this door. Yeah. It's solid and locked. Completely unaware that there's a fox and a hedgehog outside the door from the cellar into the sewer. Joe Starling successfully picks another lock. The door opens. He finds himself staring across the sewer at a hedgehog with a burning brand. The look of surprise on the hedgehog's face. He then cries out and calls his boss to come back and help. It's all going to get very messy in the general store cellar. Gung Ho hides. He hadn't been seen. Only the Stalin had been spotted by the hedgehog. Hicks the sewer jack, the brave mouse, investigates the fallen door. He looks into the cellar and is met by an ambush. A crossbow bolt from Raxo catches him in the chest. He stumbles backwards, falls into the murky water of the sewer. So Harley leaps out of his hiding place, charged out onto the sewer, and with one final blow, finished the life of the unfortunate mouse. Its body swept away in the green goo and current. Vasquez arrived at one end of the tunnel and at the other, Apone, the toad mage, also arrived. The plan appears to be working. Sir Hartley and his squire and beast at arms do appear to be dragging all the attention in their direction. Nicodemus casts a spell upon Joe Stalin. He infuses him with an overwhelming sense of speed and haste. The Stalin turns and flees, heads to an open doorway, attempting to escape. Vasquez, armed with her crossbow, shoots a well aimed shot straight into the chest of Sir Harley. The blow is so powerful, not only does it do him grievous wound, it knocks him sideways and he also falls into the sewer. Ignoring the pain in his chest, Sir Hartley clambers out of the side of the sewer and attacks the unfortunate Drake. Drake takes several serious blows and is also finished on the side of the sewer. The slippery Starling manages to escape from the blows of Gorman who stands and fights against Gung Ho. Drake hears the noise out on the main sewer and makes his way across the bridge and down the tunnel. Master Nicodemus goes with Joe, leaving the unfortunate Gung Ho to act as a brave rearguard in the cellar of the shop. Frost the Hedgehog joins the fight. Gung Ho is outnumbered but he's going to go down fighting. 
It's a ferocious, vicious battle. Blows are exchanged, wounds are taken. Nobody can get an advantage. On the main sewer, Sir Hartley has his beast at arms and Squire start to shoot crossbow bolts down the tunnel. It's hard to miss. The mage and the newt are under the light of the lantern on the, ju the junction. Apon, the toad mage, attempts to make Ripley the newt harder wearing by making her flesh like oak. But even so, several crossbow bolts shot by Raxo and Frisbee is enough to do for the unfortunate newt. Staggering near death, she still attempts to charge the mouse at arms. In her weakened state, it's no surprise that the newt's blows bounce off the armoured mouse. Drake the rat makes his way as quickly as he can towards the sound of combat in the main sewer, drawn away from the fleeing Starlin and Otter Mage. The fight in the cellar carried on. Gung ho, screaming and shouting, hollering and whooping, hitting as hard as he can with his large hammer. He crushed the arm of Gorman, but Gorman continued to fight. Frisbee stepped into the combat with the newt, and although he only did a minor wound, it was enough to knock Ripley into the wall. Apone, the toad mage, made tiny creatures appear all over Raxo, spiders and insects of all kinds, biting, stinging, making him upset enough for him to flap his arms around, try to get them all off, and he also tumbled into the sewer. Unfortunately for the Toad Mage, this left a clear way for Sir Hartley to make his way forward. Ignoring his wounds, Sir Hartley's blow was devastating. The unfortunate Toad, despite his toughness, was crushed, his limp body falling into the water. But over for the unfortunate Gung Ho in the store cellar, he fought bravely to the last, but in the end, the outcome was inevitable, and the warrior fell, crashing to the floor. Gorman, the fox, and leader of the Toshers was delighted. He ordered Frost, the hedgehog, to slap the manacles on the fallen rabbit. Drake, the rat sewer jack, now had three enemies approaching him down the sewer. The bodies of Ripley the Newt and Apone the Toad Mage floated in the sewer water bobbing in the goo. There was still sound of fighting at the other end of the tunnel. Drake knew his best bet would be to leave and go and find his commander, Gorman. Having successfully defeated, captured Gung Ho, Gorman and Frost made their way through the tunnels, past their bridge, searching for further members of the retinue. Little did they know, Nicodemus hid on the bridge and Joe Stalin nervously sculpted by the door to the pub cellar. As Gorman Frost made their way past the bridge and down the sewer to where the most noise was. Where Sir Harley and the rest of the retinue were still fighting. Nicodemus and Joe made it across the bridge and again Joe managed to pick a lock and open his way up into what appeared to be the cellar of a local tavern. The cellar of the tavern, full of barrels and supplies, was half lit. Joe Starlin and Nicodemus made their way between the wine and the beer and the mead. And it was Joe that found a set of stairs that led up from the cellar into the public bar, the Sun in Splendor Tavern, and thus out into the sunlight. On this occasion, the slippery Starlin and his escort had managed to outfox the fox and all of his toshes. They could make their way down to the harbour, hopefully 
without further issue. So Hartley and his retainers had done all they could. They had made as much noise as possible, dispatched four of the sewer jack patrol. They would make their way to the surface and down to the harbour and they hoped and prayed that Nicodemus and Gung Ho had been successful in their mission and had successfully managed to get Joe Starling out of the sewers. So there you go, that's our third game in this campaign. I hope you enjoyed that one. It was good fun to play. We played that one several times through, uh, more than anything else, to get a grip of the uh, underground rules that we'd never used before. Uh, I've got to say I'm really pleased with the look of the table, which was the point in many ways of, of playing, playing this scenario, was to build all this kind of like uh, cool stuff. I, I really like it. I hope you really like the look of the table. It worked out really, really well. If you want to know how I made all this stuff and you haven't seen it already, go and check out the uh, um, sewers builds. Uh, there's a link down below. I'm really pleased with those. It was a very interesting game to play. Uh, it was kind of frustrating. The the narrow confines, the being in the dark, the getting backed up. Uh, definitely adds a different kind of layer of uh, thinking and strategy you have to apply to your play in this game because even more so than before it matters who which characters you move and in what order you move them in because if they can like block you in and keep you stuck where you are it can cause all kinds of problems um so it was it was a good fun game i thoroughly recommend playing games underneath uh, in the burrows of burrows and badgers. You don't need to go to town and make all of these kind of uh, pieces if you like. There are loads of different ways you can do it. There are lots of 3D printable dungeons nowadays. Um, there are uh, lots of games that had dungeons anyway. No, oh, the new Warhammer Quest, for example. The old Warhammer Quest. Either of those would do. Advanced Hero Quest if you've still got that kicking around. Or you could just do it on a, a tabletop and draw on what you needed. Any of those would work really, really well. So if you're a B&B player and you've played only above ground so far, seriously, check out playing underground. It's not going to be my main way of playing. I love all the 3D elements and the buildings and everything else. But it does certainly make a change. So... At the end of our story then, Sir Hartley and his retinue have made it out of the sewers. Uh, Nicodemus and Joe Starlin made their way up a set of stairs and out onto the street through a public house. And Sir Hartley and the other fellows, they made their way back up to the surface as well. And they will meet up with each other down on the quayside for the next game where they have to take ship. There you go. If you enjoyed that and you have would like to see more, then please do leave comments down below. I'd love to know what you think of our games, of the terrain and everything else and how we played it. If you enjoyed that and you want to see more battles in this campaign, make sure you click like and subscribe and do all that stuff. Uh, and if you want to do the kind of like the full-on support Tim and Magrathea Builder Worlds, then of course you can sign up at my Patreon uh, Patreon dot com slash magrathia builder worlds and if you do that now you'll be joining up on time for the uh april competition which is going to be available in two or three weeks time better go on and finish the christmas competition prize hadn't i really so if we can get that out and sent to america anyway thanks very much for watching burrows and badgers on magrathia builder worlds i'll see you next time <laughs>